this is a topic very close to my heart because although as a white woman in Australia, I live a life of extraordinary privilege. I am also a, a queer woman and I live with a disability. One that until recently was not portrayed with any dignity or agency. But thanks to movements like this, that is changing. The filmmaker in me also wanted, wanted to know about how telling a story about your own life and about your own community changes the mode of storytelling. So I'd also like to introduce uh, our moderator for tonight, uh, the extraordinary Anna Tiwari. Anna is a producer director with over 25 broadcast documentary credits, including for the National Geographic Channel and ABC TV. She has lived a multicultural lived experience, having lived and worked in India, Germany, Canada, West Africa, the US, and has called Australia home for over a decade. Anna runs Indivi uh, Individual Films, a production company that specialises in stories from a diverse and underrepresented uh, community. In her spare time, Anna volunteers to support marginalised voices in the media industry in different ways, including the, the popular Facebook community for, that's been going for almost 10 years, Diversity in Australian Media. So uh, I'd like you all to welcome Anna. Thank you. Take it away. Thanks Donna and I just want to say a big welcome to everyone who is here today and also um, who's here physically but also via live stream. So um, hello to everyone out there. <laughs> um, and I'm delighted to be part of this event because I, I've admired the work that Ausdocs has been doing for a long time now. It's a wonderful community and I love being part of it. Um, but also it's a very special event because uh, it's a panel that is, that is dedicated to the topic of rep representation, which is um, a topic that is close to my heart as well. I first heard the statement, uh, nothing about us without us, uh, in the context of the Australian media industry a few years ago um, when Sophia Golan said uh, these powerful words in a speech and it really stayed with me. Um, th this empowering phrase has had an interesting history uh, that can be traced back to um, a Polish law that uh, came about in the early 1500s. So it's, it's long, long, <laughs> you know, way back. Um, and it, what it stated was that the king could not pass laws without going through the parliament. So it was sort of setting, um, uh, you know, uh, it was starting off the sort of, it was the touchstone of democracy in Central Europe at that time. It was later revived in the 1980s by Eastern European disability activists and the slogan found resonance in South Africa. Uh, this mantra has become a rallying call for disability rights groups uh, around the world and it really um, you know, created a movement in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. And it has continued to expand in relevance to other social justice, equality and inclusion causes. Over the years, I've seen the conversation around representation expand and evolve on the Diversity in Australian Media Facebook group. Uh, we have a really interesting sort of thriving community and people post things from around the world, articles from you know, international things as well as local um, sort of uh, ideas and thoughts. Um, documentary filmmaking methods that exploit, extract or engage in cultural colonization are being questioned um, increasingly. There is a growing awareness and movement to stop unethical practices and, uh, and there's a movement towards allowing communities to own, create and share their own stories with uh, more creative and financial freedom. We are moving away from the, um, uh, from, uh, the lived experience co consultants model to a more meaningful collaboration model where people come on board and collaborate in, in sort of more uh, key creative roles. Um, so many Australian documentary filmmakers have dedicated their lives to ethical, respectful ways of telling stories that are not their own and many of those filmmakers are part of Ausdocs and they set really good examples for, uh, for documentary filmmakers like me that are following in their footsteps. Um, and, but, but then there are also many others who continue to build entire careers on extractive documentary filmmaking practices. This is why it is important to talk about nothing about us without us. And I hope there will be regular sessions on this topic um, so that we can expand this conversation and continue to learn and grow and evolve because there's so much to learn in this space. Um, but today we will make a good start with our wonderful panel. And let me start by introducing our first panelist, Amin Palangi. Um, 
Amin is a writer and director of documentary and fictional films. His debut feature film, Love, Marriage in Kabul, was finalist at the Walkley Awards for Excellence in Journalism. It was the winner of Audience Award at Sydney Film Festival. And he also won the Best Director from the ADG, the Australian Directors Guild, which was fantastic. And um, Amin is also the artistic director of the Persian Film Festival, which is a really successful and popular festival. Um, and he's been running it for seven years. Amin holds a PhD in Film Studies from ANU and Masters in Screenwriting from Afters. And currently, um, he is a lecturer in screen production at the University of New South Wales and also a member of the Screen New South Wales Industry Advisory Committee. So welcome, Amin. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now introducing our second panelist, Sue Goldfish. Sue, welcome. Um, Sue is a writer-director and she studied documentary at Afters here in 2010 and has worked for 25 years as a performer, writer, filmmaker and producer. She facilitated a project for UNSW that adapted three of artist William Yang's performance works into screen-based works. Sue was co-producer of My Generation, Blood Links and Friends of Dorothy, all of which screened on ABC One and in film festivals locally and internationally. Last year, Sue made a wonderful documentary. It's called The Last Goldfish, and you will see clips of it today, um, which is about her search for her lost family that stretches from Australia to Trinidad and uh, World War II Germany. Sue is producer and manager of the UNSW Creative Practice Lab in the School of Arts and Media. She produces performance and media works, mentors students, and collaborates with academic staff and artists. So we didn't know we were going to be on this panel together. <laughs> <laughs> And we have Adrian Russell Wills. Adrian studied directing at Afters as well before making the critically acclaimed documentary Our Bush Wedding in 2005. He continued exploring the documentary form, co writing and directing the groundbreaking When the Natives Get Restless in 2007. In 2010, his documentary Boxing for Palm Island screened at the Message Stick Film Festival. Adrian then moved into writing and directing television drama and has directed episodes of Wonderland, Rush, The Gods of Eat Street, Redfern Now, Ready for This, Wentworth and Warriors, which is absolutely amazing <laughs> um, body of work. Um, Adrian has recently directed the documentary Black Divas, and again, you'll see the trailer here today, which premiered at Queer Screen as part of the Sydney Mardi Gras 2018 Film Festival and screened on NITV SBS. So, welcome Adrian. And we have Lazarus Lodi. Uh, Laz studied photography at the German School of Photography Center for the Media Arts in New, uh, in, uh, New York uh, in the late 80s. And he moved to Australia in 1997, so he's a migrant with an accent. <laughs> you will find out. Um, he started working as a cameraman in 2006, worked on some short films for Tropfest, music videos, and Music Oz Awards, um, until he lost his right leg in a motorcycle accident on Boxing Day in 2008. Laz worked on a TV show in Melbourne called No Limits, which was a show by, for, and about, the, about people with disabilities. It aired in 13 countries. He was also a consultant on a short film about amputees in 2012. Recently, Laz was in a documentary short series for SBS, and he will be a guest on the feed talking about the Veely Good Bag and his latest documentary project, Veel a Mile, which you will hear about uh, in a bit and see some snippets from as well. So, welcome, Laz. So I wanted to kick off uh, the panel discussion with the, uh, a question on the theme itself, which is nothing about us without us. And I wanted to find out what our panelists feel about this phrase and what it means to you personally based on your lived experience and your identity and your work. So should we start with you, Amit? <laughs> Do you want to? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, uh, to, to be honest, to me, the, the phrase um, is quite obvious and accepted, perhaps. It's something um, I've learned the hard way myself. Um, I think sometimes it's uh, quite an easy mistake, especially if you're a young filmmaker. I remember, um, I mean, you'll see my film, and it's actually a project set in Afghanistan, and I am not of an Afghan background. Um, the first time I went to Afghanistan, uh, and this experience has always stayed with me, um, it was in 2004, and it was just after the Taliban had left, and 
Um, I was a very young um, student at the time, wanted to make a short film, um, went to my country next door, which was Iran, and then thought, uh, you know, through some uh, connections, I got excited to go to Afghanistan. And um, I make the story quite short. I made a short film about women committing suicide by self-burning. Quite a horrific um, story, a theme, and I was completely affected by it. Uh, and I was like, I, I gotta have to make this. I, you know, the, the world has to know about this. Uh, I made a short film, uh, came back to Canberra, and the film was screened. And I was uh, standing quite excitedly at the back of the room, hoping that people are gonna watch this story and the the women, uh, many of which would have you know passed away in the film actually because they were so badly burnt. People are going to watch this and go, oh my God, like I'm just like this person. This is going to inform, just going to create a movement, you know, pretty ambitious ideas uh, as a young filmmaker. Uh, but while I was standing at the back of a room, somebody said that, oh, you know, it's Afghanistan, this sort of stuff happens there. And this really uh, broke me. Uh, it really hurt me enormously and made me realize that although I was pretty uh, close, uh, I understood the culture, I could understand the language, um, I had made a huge mistake uh, by representing a culture in a way that anyone else would have without a solid understanding, without really knowing where I'm coming from and just simply being affected by the horrific situation that was there. And so this experience was a turning point, um, at, at least in my career and the kind of work um, I started doing. And in fact, the reason why I made Love, Marriage in Kabul, because I felt this huge debt uh, to that country. Um, so I guess now the, the, the phrase is quite uh, clear for me. It's yeah. quite an, an obvious mm -hmm. uh, process uh, for any, uh, anyone who wants to make anything really. Um, whether it's about your own community or something else, there's always mm -hmm. things that you need to know and there needs to be a meaningful engagement. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to make a mistake about your own community as well if you're not really aware. Mm -hmm. And I think good intentions are not enough is something we're all learning as yeah. we're going along because there's more to it. Yeah. Um, what would you like to say, Sue, about um, your own? Yeah, um, I, I think with that particular statement, for me, my response to it is there's this kind of like um, administrative level, which is practical about who's on your team, you know, the story that's being told, who's telling that story. And that operates in all aspects of our lives, you know, that we can go into workplaces and you can look around the room and you can see if everyone looks like you or if, you know, there's a, a diverse range of people in that room with you. So the, the ringing of the bell in your head, which makes you conscious of difference and not always seeking out the same. Um, so it's, but it is kind of like an administrative level. It's um, you know being very practical and making sure if you have a responsibility, particularly in offering roles to people on shoots and things like that, that you're um, you know taking gender and race and ethnicity, all those things into um, the balance of what you're doing. But really importantly, obviously, is the story and about who's telling the story and why. And I think you know it's not. It's not one thing or another. It's not like, you know, only you can only tell your own story. But ultimately, the story has to have integrity. It has to have truth. And I think sometimes you find these things out after you've made it. And it can be painful, like the story you're telling. And um, that's how you learn. But often, if you're going on a process where you're inclusive and collaborative and trying to work with people, you, you, you get so much wisdom from the people around you that ultimately there is truth and kind of integrity in what you deliver. And that's kind of, I have a lot of faith in process. So that's my response to that. That's fantastic. And Adrian, what? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, and it's a very interesting topic. Um, I agree with the sentiments so far as well. Um, I, can take, I can take a really hard line on it as well, I can I can sort of go from from an extreme of one to the other, almost to the point of like films for us by us, to, right through to the administration level of, you know, being in the room and being part of the conversation. Um, I guess my best, or when I saw the question, my response to it was when I made the film when the natives get restless. The reason why I made that film was because there was a particular housing estate in Dubbo that was constantly on the news um, 
predominantly Aboriginal housing estate residents um, and whenever you'd watch the news or the story on television you'd see um, a, sh a shot through the police car windows as they drive past the houses and you'd see the people that they're talking about you know through the, the windows down that much because it's a very dangerous area and the camera would be hanging out of the window that much and I thought well how can you tell tell the world and tell Australia particularly about these people when you're shooting through a frame of that much as you drive past. So the whole premise of when the neighbors get restless was to go inside the house, point the camera the other way. And I think that for me is what that statement speaks to. That's great. And Laz? Last but not least, um, yeah, I also would like to thank everyone for having me here today. I feel a little bit underdressed as far as uh, qualifications. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of new to the whole being on the side of making things, but um, you know, as a person who acquired a disability, um, it's, I have a different view as to someone who is born with their disability as well, so it's very different. Um, but for me, it's, a, it's really important that people, you know, it's nice to tell someone's story, but you have to include that person as well. And it's not just about, you know, showing them on the screen, but having them collaborate and be a part of that whole process because otherwise you're not really getting the full story you're getting your point of view um so yeah it's really important that people are included and are a part of and even you know just in fictional stuff as well you know um hiring actors with disabilities uh, rather than having an able-bodied person play a person with a disability um there's a whole different you know point of view from that yeah so it's just really important to be inclusive with everything we were talking when we had a phone chat, we were talking about the benefits of that when the stories come from within and, and why that's important, especially in the disability sector, because this phrase has a special meaning for the, the disability uh, community. Um, about uh, a lot of people don't understand the lived experience and it, you know, so... Yeah, that's right. And so that's what my pro current project is about. It's about, um, you know, getting people who are able-bodied um, I guess we'll talk about it later, but um, to understand what it's like for someone in a wheelchair um, by actually living that experience in a, in a very short time frame um, with not the same limitations, but just to get a little taste of what it's, what it's like. And a lot of times, um, you know, people with disabilities, I guess when people hear, people hear the word disability, they have, there's assumptions and stigmas that are attached to that word. Um, and so it's an automatic assumption that a person who has a disability, there's some kind of intellectual uh, thing going on, um, which is not the case for everyone. Yes, of course, there's intellectual disabilities, but there's physical disabilities, which, you know, I mean, <laughs> look at Hawking's, you know, like there's great minds out there. Um, and so just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean you're, you're not capable. And um, that often happens with people with disabilities and people trying to come in and not... Um, and not seeing that person for who they are and trying to take over as well. So it's really important that they get to have their voice. Mm -hmm. Can we play clip one, please? The trailer of Love, Marriage in Kabul. I got touched that I'm in Zara, but I'm not I'm not there. I'm not as that's just for now. As that's my tap on now. But I'm just shooting. I'm just salam. I'm just I love you. Last time I talked with Dr. Vistan, but the hell of a body act mobile as it's got a man a whole nother ship. But then I stuck out with my man. Abdel was one of the first children that I rescued. He grew up such a good young man. If my mother is here, she will be fine. The first time I saw him, he saw me last night. He said that he was afraid of me. 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 
قلبم سر چشمه میزند نام تو یاد تو تصویر تو حرف ها و با نفس های تو زنده هستم That's um, such a beautiful film. I mean, um, I, I watched it again last night. It was amazing. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about what cultural lens did you have on while making this documentary, and how did you prepare prepare for it? Uh, I just mentioned I made a bad film first. So <laughs> 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 made quite a big mistake. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess um, this time around, uh, I started working on the film. Uh, about three years before everything was shot, uh, I met uh, the main uh, character of the film, which is Mahbuba Rawi, uh, a woman who totally affected me because she was so persuasive and uh, is an Afghan-Australian woman who's been here as a refugee for the past 30 years and has uh, established um, an orphanage back in Afghanistan yeah. with Australian money. Uh, so it's a quite a groundbreaking project. Um, and uh, I got really fascinated about her and what she was doing and I started following her around uh, for about three years uh, hoping that I can get uh, a way into her story which is not um, a sort of a corporate kind of video about yeah. you know um, a charity organization um, and one day she contacted me and said you know there's a boy who uh, is in the orphanage and is one of the first boys I've rescued and um, he's in love with the girl next door Mm. So, <laughs> I had some savings and I went and shot the film. It was pretty easy. But um, um, the, the, I, I guess the, the things that were going for me was that um, uh, I sort of had a background uh, that was not the same but similar culturally. I understood the cultural sensitivities and the language. Um, I could understand about 80%. Um, I had the subject with me. Uh, Mahbuba was very much the driver of the story and everything that was happening. I literally just turned the camera on mm -hmm. and made sure I do not turn it off because <laughs> I was worried I, I'm going to miss something. Um, yeah. uh, my producer Pat Fisk wasn't very happy about that because you know we end up with hours and hundreds of hours of footage. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think other things was that I ensured that um, I have a female uh, with me. There was a two-man show, or a woman and a man show, uh, pardon me. Mm -hmm. uh, my sound recordist um, was uh, Sonaz Futuhi, so um, that sort of uh, enabled us um, getting access yeah. uh, or gaining trust from families that I wasn't just a single man, I was with mm -hmm. uh, another person, a, a woman, which yeah. sort of helped a lot. Mm -hmm. These were, I think, the things that um, um, we thought about uh, at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, but in terms of any other, I mean, it, a lot of it also was on the fly. Lots of yeah. um, crazy things happened and lots of really mm -hmm. good things happened, yeah. um, things that you couldn't have been aware for. But yeah. I think a lot of the conversation uh, for me happened after the shooting period in the edit because then it was about what we we're putting out there yeah. uh, out of this and um, for me from the beginning was very important uh, to like to be very clear on the fact that who the film is for mm -hmm. um, and the film was always for whoever who is not Afghan and in particular the Western community or the Australian community for me was really Mm -hmm. uh, in mind and as a result in order to even be careful about my own uh, mm -hmm. preconceived ideas I worked with a team that were from that community so mm -hmm. it was very 
quite privileged to work with Bill Rosso as mm -hmm. the editor, yeah. um, who's very experienced. I mean, his experience was yeah. obviously very helpful for me as a young filmmaker, but also mm -hmm. the fact that he was the other I was trying to convince. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't speak the language, so I had to log everything. Um, but through our conversation and through our, I guess, arguments, um, <laughs> we um, hopefully managed to uh, present something that was reaching out to the audience that I was intending to. And you mentioned language that you do understand Dari and 80%, um, but that's really helpful, isn't it? How important was knowing the language in this sort of uh, project? In this sort of project, uh, I don't think it would have been possible with that, as I mentioned, because um, I mean, there was no room for translations. Mm -hmm. um, everything is sort of happening. The, the style of the film is quite observational. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent many nights with Abdul and in his room and we're just having conversations. I think um, they are very, it's a very sort of a shy culture, I guess in a way there's a lot of, uh, there's a very big difference between private space and public space. Uh, so to be able to gain access into that sort of private space, I think it was just mm -hmm. absolutely necessary to be trusted, but also to speak the language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. And um, as filmmakers that come from marginalized communities, oftentimes what happens is we get pigeonholed, you know. So, okay, Anna, you, you've lived mostly in India, you know, tell Indian stories. <laughs> and um, we don't want to be pigeonholed. We want to be free to be able to tell the stories we want to tell. So um, how do you cope with that? And what sort of projects are you interested in? And, you know, and uh, what do you think about the pigeonholing of Hmm. I scream like into a pillow every morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, it's a big question. I mean, at the moment, I'm getting pigeonholed into making documentaries, to be honest. That's the label mm. I'm trying to okay. shake. Um, that's I, a difficult I think one as well. That's a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think being... Wrong crowd. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> um, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I mean, you make stories, you want to tell stories that uh, perhaps you know about um, or understand, mm -hmm. uh, but also something that moves you um, um, because you're going to live with it, as I'm sure everyone here mm -hmm. knows and in the audience for a number of years. So you're going to have to live with this baby you're mm -hmm. trying to give birth to and it's going to be there um, with you for a long time. So you better love it, actually. Yeah. Um, but in terms of being pigeonholed by the industry mm -hmm. or by policies, etc. Um, I find that it's a very competitive time mm -hmm. and uh, I guess uh, I don't particularly like uh, being pigeonholed, but I also perhaps think that it's my responsibility to mm -hmm. have to work extra hard to sort of um, prove mm -hmm. it otherwise, because I think the same time that you get pigeonholed, if you produce something else, like if I produce another film and it's completely different story, I'm going to get pigeonholed in that. Um, mm -hmm. And then people are going to completely forget about mm -hmm. um, me, let's say, as a documentary filmmaker, and now it's like, oh, a fictional filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, just a very natural process in which that societies or people just like to judge. And, and label. That, and yeah. label, and that's yeah. just... Uh, part of it, uh, I mean, obviously in an ideal world, you hope that's not the case, but it, mm. it happens. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to clip two, please, which is the trailer of The Last Goldfish. This is my father. He tells me stories. My beautiful blue eyes. They bear once. But not always the truth. To understand, we have to go back to where I was born. I love Trinidad, but in the 70s, an attempted military coup forces us to leave. Australia is our new home. Now everyone seems to be white. I know my father is German. I ask him, are we Jewish? All of these people can't have just disappeared. He tells me, you are the last goldfish. I was 14 when I started this search for my family. I remember him like this, surrounded by women. I remember him. I found the woman who saved my father's life. They came in the night, told me that I'm under arrest, but uh, I don't want to go into that story. They are two of only 600 who make it to Trinidad. 
I find a brother and sister. I had to come here and touch the walls of the buildings where my family lived. It's very important to me. That's all. My father made a decision to live again and never look back, but he left me clues and they led me here. <laughs> So, so let's talk about this sort of style of filmmaking, which is very personal. It's, it's uh, about your family. How challenging was it getting it made and what were the challenges along the way? Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> where do you start? <laughs> Look, I think as somebody who likes to make things, sometimes with other people, sometimes it's their stories, sometimes, you know, it's like, I don't know, a little performance girl gang and you're, you know, creating stuff for... I don't know, a queer performance in maybe 1993. Um, you know, it depends on, again, the story. And often those stories are coming from us because um, I was often working with other queer people to tell stories. So I've been thinking about this story for a long time, but it's so complicated why I would want to make it. Like it kind of started because my father would never tell me anything. So it was a, a, a film about secrets. And so I'd read things about secrets and trauma and why people didn't speak after they'd been through kind of severely traumatic experiences at the same time while trying to get a story out of him, which was very difficult because he would often stop stop me asking questions and he, you know, or he'd evade things. Um, so it's, the film is very much a mystery story and, and a lot of it takes place after my father's died because I've kind of given up. So it turns into a kind of detective story after that. But it's very layered because ultimately it's about all these identities and um, discrimination. And I always wanted to tell his story because he would never tell it himself. So it felt like, well, I'll tell it for you in this documentary. And in fact, one of the lines that he once said to me on camera was, you can watch all that on a documentary. And it's like, all right, then I'll make it, you know? <laughs> so I just make it. But when you start really working on it and you start actually working on it as a film with other people, you know, and I'm, this is the thing around collaboration and the outside eyes that the team bring to the project, more and more it became important that I was a character in the film, which I didn't feel particularly comfortable about initially. But after a while, I had a kind of schizophrenic thing where I could actually see myself as a character. So I started writing myself as a character in as honest a way as I could. And then people around me would say, that's not honest enough. And they'd kind of push me to be, you know, even more honest. So it ends up being extremely personal. But I do have this kind of separation from it that it's also this character. And the character is a, a lesbian narrator who is telling the story of discrimination against her, you know, that happened to her father and his family, which is her family, around him being Jewish. But he ended up as a refugee in Trinidad. So he ended up being this kind of white European and this very, very diverse, mainly black Indian, African Indian community. Um, so immediately it's even more complex because even though he's escaping for his life and his, you know, his family is, you know, many of them were murdered in the camps, he's still a European in a, in a colonial country. So the power relationships shift so I grow up in that, that society as this white kid who, who grew up in a family where no one talked about anything. They didn't even talk about people's race. So I didn't really think about race at all. I just was a little Trinidadian. And it was, wasn't until the kind of civil rights movement that the black, when black pow, the black power movement kind of came into being, which sort of started in America and started spreading through lots of colonial countries. In fact, you know, Papua New Guinea, lots of, you know, on this side of the world as well, is sort of growing consciousness. And it's from a very personal experience. It's from being called names in the street and being told you don't belong there. And it's like, but where do I come from? 
And, you know, in school, I, you know, I was told I wasn't allowed to be friends with my, you know, Indian, Trinidadian friend. And, you know, why not? You, you know, and you're like 12. We're trying to work out identity pro politics at 12 in the classroom. It's amazing. And then you end up in Australia and everyone does seem to be white. It's like, it's full on. I had such a shock. And so it's, again, another displacement experience. And then my parents, who've now moved in the, you know, they're like in their 60s, of course, they end up with terrible jobs and end up quite poor. And then I turn into a lesbian. And that really, my parents just don't approve of that. They never approve of it. For my whole life, they never approved of it. They just never spoke about it. So there's this other weird layer of, um, you know, discrimination that's going on within my family. So it's so complicated. So what I try to do is just travel through this film and let people to see all these like moments where you have to kind of think, you know, about all of those issues, mm -hmm. while at the same time it's got, you know, because of course it's very personal in the sense of looking for people who are you're going to be connected to, you know, by blood. But it's also about community. It's about the family I made, which is the queer community and. So, yeah, so sorry, that's a big rave, but I just felt like, yeah, yeah that's it's just complicated. It's amazing. I, again, I watched it recently and, and just completely got absorbed in it. People do love these deeply personal stories, but you were able to expand it to talk about bigger issues, refugee crisis, and it's so relevant to what's happening in the world today yeah. as well. Yeah. But there's always this resistance to funding projects yeah. like this. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. the challenges in... It, in that space yeah that was it was very hard it was like people are very suspicious you know why you why your story <laughs> so you do have to if you do if that's as an artist that's your burning desire that you have to tell this story that's connected to you and that's the truth of what you're trying to do you have to if you can't fund it yourself then you are going to have to try and explain to funding bodies why it is that this particular personal story is going to change how people feel or that it will actually appeal to a very, very broad audience, not just people who kind of have a similar story to you. It also makes you think through your story, and it's fair enough. You know, like you could tell a story like this at um, Queer Stories on a Friday night at um, Giant Dwarf, and I could probably just do what I just did then, just tell the whole story, and it would be like, oh, that was interesting, you know. But, you know, if you want to make a film, and, you know, I was fascinated with my father's photographs, and I felt like I had this rich, aesthetic, kind of personal archive. And this was the other thing around community, where you find information, that you're not finding it in necessarily a public archive, you're finding it in your own, you know, photo albums and under the bed, you know, where people, are, where things are getting mouldy and you clean them off, you know, and oh, there's, you know, miracles appear, you know. So... Yeah, mm -hmm. and ultimately we got a little bit of funding in the beginning, but then it all fell apart and then we had to raise money. It was a very complicated and hard process and you give up if you don't really need to do it, but I needed to do it. So, you know, got there in the end. And when you're making something that's deeply personal, there's this insider outsider perspective that you have to try and balance. Mm. Um, so how did you go about sort of finding that balance um, in, in this project? Yeah. And that was where the team came in. So when the film, like two years before it was finished, we really started putting together a, a team. The person who became the most important was the script editor. So I chose someone who knew me, but who was a, a director and also taught script writing and obviously wrote scripts. And that person became my outside kind of ears and eyes. So whenever I would chicken out of things, you know, she'd kind of really make me come back in and tell those parts of the story that were quite difficult. But she also made me let go of things. So it's like, yeah, that matters to you, but it's not going to matter to anyone else. And with the team, you have to really trust the experience of those people around you. You also, you know, if things... There's sometimes I think you need to hold your ground, but you also have to explain why and, um, you know, have some pretty good reasons why when you're faced with six people all going, you know, that shouldn't be in there. But that's what I was talking about, like, right at the beginning. It's this process, a, a collaborative process, and through this bubbles up the story, it just gets refined and refined and refined until, you know, you offer it to your first audience and hold your breath to see what will happen. 
Okay, um, that sounds great. And let's go, let's go to clip number three, which is Black Divas, please. One, two, cha cha cha. Three, four, cha cha cha. Drag queens, for Pete's sake. I want to see some energy from you. Five, six, seven, eight. This isn't show up and be fabulous. There's skills to being a drag queen. I have to start taking this seriously. I'm an alcoholic. When I'm depressed, I drink. I'm so lucky that I have my sister girl family who help me. Oh, look at you, sister. I met TJ five years ago. No, I don't have to explain myself, him being the career man himself. Some days I'd leave the house and I'd just panic. Like, I just always had that feeling that I shouldn't be somewhere in public. Being gay wasn't really hard at all. I either take on the hate or walk down the street and work it. Work being gay. The thing about Aboriginal drag is you're representing all of the mob out there who don't have the same opportunities you do right now. This is First Nation! You have responsibility. Are you ready to meet our contestants? Mm. My vagina is too big for <laughs> <laughs> Adrian, so yes. tell us a bit about this project. How did it come about? Why did you want to make this story? Um, miscellaneous, who was talking at the end there, um, is a good friend of mine, Ben. So I've known him for a long time. And they were they put out a call out to um, for contestants for the first Miss First Nations drag pageant um, to be held in Darwin. And it kind of just sold itself. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, you know, I've, I've grown up around drag. Um, it's a spiritual kind of place for me. Um, and there's something putting the black and the drag together that just kind of tips me over the edge. Um, and that's why, I, you know, it was a big smack over the head, sort of, instantly. As soon as I saw it, I knew I was going to make that film. Um, and I knew I was the right person to make that film. Selfish as that may sound, and bold. <laughs> I just knew from inside yeah. that... And also, funnily enough, not that that's an ego thing. It was more confirmed for me when we screened the film to an audience. And a lot of other gay Indigenous boys came up, or guys came up to me and said, oh, thank you so much, I, I've, I've never seen myself in a film before. I said, bitch, it wasn't about you. <laughs> it was about, you know, it's about drag queens. And, but then I realised what they were saying was true. It was about being black and queer, and it was their story. And I remember being in bars as a young, thin, handsome man, um, and, you know, experiencing all these stories. Um, and, and moments and thinking, you know, um, and then we, when we made Black Divas, somehow they all came and rolled into the film. We, we explored suicide, um, addiction, self-worth, fabulousness, body image, transgender, um, identity, you know, cultural, I mean it was all, it was just, it was kind of like my, so much of my life experience in a, <clears throat> in a bag mixed in with all those other queens that we journeyed with. Um, and sort of, I was, you know, the director of the film but it was, everyone made the film together, yeah, particularly the, the contestants. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, that you were the director, but everyone else was involved in making it. That's really interesting to me. How I like to watch, <laughs> literally. Um, I'm not very good at talking and being on panels and, and being under a spotlight like I'm the last drinks at a bar. Um, <laughs> it's 
but I like to watch. And look, I'm a big guy, but I can sit in a room and you won't know that I'm there. Um, I remember following, when I first got into TV, I did an attachment to Dana Reid on a show called Rush. And I was with her the whole time. And I pulled up at some point and said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not, obviously, I'm not stalking you. I'm supposed to be here. And she goes, you know, I don't even know you're there. Mm. I can't even, I completely forget you're there. Mm. And I realised it was from years of doing observational documentary where my role is to disappear into the background, you know. And it's to the camera and the people I choose to work with, they disappear into all, well, the camera not so much because there's a dance happening, particularly with observational, that's particular to being in and of the moment. But, yeah, for me, my job is to disappear, so I like to sit back and watch. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. And you work a lot in drama, and you've been doing more and more drama, directing and, and writing episodes as well for Redmond Now and things like that. Um, comparing that with documentary in terms of uh, getting at the heart of a community or, or speaking these truths, can you sort of talk a little bit about the comparison or the difference that you see or similarities that you see between the two different formats? Yeah, look, for me it kind of speaks to what we were talking about before about um, pigeonholing. Um, and I, I hadn't made doco for, a doco for quite a while because I'd been off doing TV. Um, and when I started doing the publicity for Black Divas, the, the reporters and the, the people that were interviewing me made a big thing about, mm -hmm. you know, drama and documentary. Mm. And I just kept on wondering why they kept, they, every person I spoke to would bring that up as, a, as an issue or something to talk about. Like for me, it's like having Vegemite one morning on toast mm. and the next morning having peanut butter. Mm. Not that I'm really a big fan of peanut butter, but... <laughs> so it's, just, it's the same thing for me. It's storytelling. Mm. I'm after the same thing. I'm after the truth. Mm. Um, and whether I'm directing an actor and chasing the the truth or the moment for that character, I'm doing the same thing in docos as well. I'm chasing the moment, I'm chasing the truth. Um, so I don't see, and I teach, I teach here as one of the directing lecturers here, and I teach the students that we have, I sort of say, you know, um, you, oh, lost my train of thought a bit there, but, um, Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what your 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 role is the same, whether you're doing doco or drama. Mm. I don't see the difference. Mm. I don't see. It's like pigeonholing. It's like being an indigenous filmmaker. Mm. I remember Tracy Moffat when she first started. She made a real um, line in the sand when reporters would report her as a as an indigenous filmmaker. She'd like, or as an Aboriginal filmmaker, she would really draw the hard line and saying, "I'm a filmmaker, and I'm Aboriginal." don't connect the two. It was a real thing for her. Um, whereas for me, I was very much, don't leave out the Aboriginal or the Indigenous, because mm. that is who I am. Mm. Um, and in terms of the pigeonholing of it, for me, my whole career has been like, and to steal from RuPaul, Mother RuPaul, um, what other people think of me is none of my business. Mm. Um, so in terms of being pigeonholed by other people, I have no control over that. Mm. I can't control that. Um, I'm just storytelling. And I'm, I'm looking for projects that speak to me and stories and characters that speak to me on a level that stand out for my crowd. So there could be a, you know, a story in this room. It'll, it'll stand forward to me. It'll come out from the background and, and be, you know, I will, I will notice it. It's like seeing dead people. You know, <laughs> if you had that skill, I can walk down the street and a story can I can see a story standing out from other people, mm. and you know, and not only that, I'll see the story flash past me mm -hmm. as well visually. Mm. Yeah. And talking about this identity and, and other people, how they see you, does it create any special challenges or opportunities for you? The intersectionality, which is the indigenous and gay identity, that. Does that bring something? Well, that's the thing. I'm third, isn't it? It's like indigenous filmmaking guy, big guy. It's just, um, yeah. I remember meeting this guy once, and he goes, I'm tri I've got the triple whammy. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, 
I'm black, gay, and I'm HIV. So I'm the, I'm the triple whammy. And it's like, it's interesting to think that we categorise elements of ourselves. Um, so for me, I don't really see... I don't really see the difference. Again, it's one thing. It's in and of one thing for me. Mm. It's not, you know. It's not colliding and clashing for you. It's one. Yeah. One yeah. Impact. But you know, I do make a point of. I did make a point in my career, of um, pursuing mainstream shows, what would be perceived as mainstream shows, um, and kind of having the you know, the attitude of like well. You know, just because it's... Um, I went from Redfern now to Wonderland, you know, on purpose. Um, I don't... Yeah, the only barrier is the ones you put up for yourself. Um, so I, I'm not into having doors put up that I can't knock through if I want to. You know, that's other people's attitudes. Mm. And as I said, I can't, I can't control other people's ideas of what I should or shouldn't be, you know. Um, and that's not easy, especially in our industry, mm. because we have to... You want to, you want to get your story made, you want people to, you know, like your films or... Um, it's interesting, when people um, have asked uh, sometimes about um, who the audience is for the film, and particularly for Black Divas, and I, when I make an Indigenous film like that, I, I I only ever think of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audience. I unfortunately I don't think of any other person past that point because that's who I'm making the film for. Um, people past that point is is a bonus and fantastic, and I really hope to reach that. But my audience, I'm thinking of and, and speaking to directly, is that audience. Is indigenous audience. That's why that's why I was surprised when the indigenous, um, the gay indigenous guy, made a thing saying, "Oh, you told my story," mm. because I wasn't talking to him. Mm. Uh, well, I didn't think I was. Mm. I was talking to um, other drag queens, mm. and particularly drag queens or queer people in remote communities, because we had such an incredible, we have such an incredible rate of suicide amongst our youth and our kids, and also our adults. Um, and I just feel like so much of that is to do with the LGBTQI space. And there's still a, a hell of a lot of homophobia in the Indigenous community, um, particularly around a lot of the religion and the missionaries and the religion that's in our communities. Um, Crystal, the um, beautiful woman at the end of the film there, she, they had the national costume section in the film and she dressed up as a nun um, because in her community that was, you know, what she experienced. And she said, she talks about, you know, um, religion being a real barrier or a real instigator of homophobia in her community and, and the way they perceive her as, a, as a, a trans woman of, you know, in her community. So, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question yes, or you have. ramble off into some other no. place. No, you have. Thank you. Um, okay, so we can move on to clip number four, please, which is Vila Mile. Hey, uh, today is the 23rd of June. This is my partner. She's going to keep me out of trouble while I learn how to roll in a wheelchair. Actually and going also for damage control. Damage control. So this is the chair. Yeah, can you see it? Um, that I'm going to be spending several hours in, trying to navigate the inner west. Um, hmm, wish me luck. Oh my God, nearly got that on film. Okay, thoughts in a wheelchair, take two. Um, I didn't film the last one, sat and talked to my phone. Uh, what have I learnt today after several hours in a wheelchair? Uh, my friends are higher up to get a hug. Um, people are basically nice and helpful and try to do what they can to make my life easier. I found the public really lovely. Um, 
I'm still me. That didn't change. Uh, I hated, hated being on the bus. The bus driver was lovely, didn't have any issues with public transport per se, but it was um, uncomfortable sitting facing backwards um, and I got quite sick and um, got quite nauseous, car sick. Uh, I've discovered the sex shops are out of reach now, they're all upstairs. Uh, <laughs> people with disabilities maybe aren't meant to have sex and maybe they're not meant to masturbate either. Uh, dress shops are too narrow and the clothes get in the way and the clothes racks are in the way and you're rolling over things, and you're bumping into things, and you're having to reverse and that was tough. Uh, the chemists, the shelves are too high, you can't see beyond the like third shelf up and they go right up the wall and you have no idea what's up there. Um, but it's been a good experience. It's been good to find out that the world's not made for people who have got mobility issues and being nice as a totally mobile person normally, um, it's kind of my privilege to be thoughtful and generous. I've appreciated it today. Laz, so uh, tell me a bit about this wonderful project Vila Mile. So how did this idea come about and what is the concept? So it's just in its um baby stages um, and the idea is it, I'm not actually the filmmaker everyone who's taking this challenge is the filmmaker and so um, it's about raising awareness of what it's like for people in a wheelchair um, and people take this six-hour challenge so it's you know spend six hours of your day in a wheelchair doing everyday things what you what I would do every day you know so part of your normal everyday life but it comes becomes so much different and so harder when you're using wheels instead of your legs. Um, like Yvonne was saying about reaching things, you know, or being able to see past the third shelf. I say I have a crotch eye view of the world because that's all I ever see is, you know, people zippers undone and bums in my face. And, um, you know, so I guess it's, yeah. So it, it's about people taking this challenge, challenging other people to take the challenge as well. So it actually started out as a fundraising idea and, um, you know, and, and a vlog. Um, mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know, there's more to it, you know, I can, there's something more that I can do with this, I can put this together and actually tell a, a wider story. Um, and, but it's everybody else telling the story. That, and so it's interesting because it's a bit the opposite of what you were talking about earlier. So it's not about me telling my story, it's about able-bodied people actually having the experience and telling the story for us. Um, and yeah, so it's interesting to see how that turns out, but it's just in early, early baby stages. So um, yeah, but that's the idea anyway. Yeah. It's such a great exp uh, experiment and it's so great to see the reaction and, and humor as well. So are you intending to have more humor in the, in the final documentary when you put all these videos together? Or? We'll, we'll see what happens. It's really about, so you know, everyone's experience is individual and different. So, you know, Whereas Yvonne was just saying about how um, she found the bus driver lovely and I have a real problem with bus drivers on a daily basis, you know, so, you know, there's a handful of them that are really nice, but I generally get, um, you know, bus drivers telling me there's no ramp while I'm staring at one, you know, telling me I can't get on the bus because there's people sitting in those chairs and they don't want to ask people to move, you know, and I'm late for work or whatever. Um, so, you know, there's there's gonna be different experiences for each experience as well. So, you know, and part of the challenge is, you know, taking public transport, you know, um, going shopping, meeting friends out for, for a meal or drinks, but not saying to them, oh, you've got to, you know, make sure it's a wheelchair accessible place and see if they actually think about those things. Cause nine times out of 10 people don't. Um, so it's, it, it's gonna be interesting because it's, you know, each person's experience with each thing is gonna be very different. So. Yeah, we'll see what happens, I'm not sure. I'd like to keep it lighthearted with being able to still, you know, get the message of cross as well, so. Mm. Yeah, it's an important message. And I would also uh, like for you to tell everyone about the fundraising that you're doing for a wonderful project so, so that we can all donate to it. So okay. <laughs> tell us a little bit quickly about what you want to use the, either the money. So, so the original fundraising uh, was for a product or a project that I'm doing. Uh, it's called the Wheelie Good Bag. Um, and the Wheelie Good Bag is in hospitals. 
um, and it's basically for people who have just lost a lower limb. So um, I lost my leg almost 10 years ago and I was given no information at hospital. Like, you don't really know what questions to ask when something like this happens to begin with. So you're hoping, you know, that the medical professionals that are there at hospital are going to give you the information you need, but that doesn't actually happen. Um, so now there's what's called the wheelie good bag and it's in a few hospitals. I have hospitals waiting for me to make more and get them out to them. Um, and it has all the information you need to know about what's going to happen, what's next, how, you know, how do you keep your driver's license? How do you keep your, for me, how do you keep your motorcycle license? You know, I was told because I only have one leg, I can't ride motorcycles anymore. And I didn't know that that, that wasn't true, you know, so I just accepted what I was being told. So I want people to be, you know, aware of what their rights are and, and, and what's out there for them. And, you know, it's, it's a leg. Yeah, it's, you know, a horrible experience to go through, but it's not the end of your life. It's not, you know, like there's so many amazing, wonderful things that I'm doing now that I wouldn't have done if I still had both my legs. Um, you know, and you can learn how to fly airplanes and sail boats and do all kinds of amazing things. So, um, so the fundraiser is really to raise money to keep these bags going and get them into all the hospitals in New South Wales mm -hmm. and then all, hopefully all the hospitals in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and it's just, you know, keeping people, I guess giving people hope and empowering them to do more than just sit at home and feel sorry for themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I'm launching a crowdfunding campaign shortly mm -hmm. um, through chuff.org, so it should be up in the next week. Um, and yeah, so if you just Google the wheelie good bag, um, which is a play on words, um, you, you'll sure to find it. <laughs> Fantastic. And we talked a little bit earlier about how, um, you know, uh, being an amputee and then you were, also tran uh, you were also transitioning at that point. And then for the 10 years in between, since you were a cameraman, you were working, and then the industry suddenly you were underemployed and you weren't getting that much work. So. No, I'm not you, getting any work. <laughs> so, so do you I, want to talk a bit about how the industry can, um, the documentary filmmaking world, the TV world, can um, sort of create more opportunities for someone like you or make it easier for you to be employed? Uh, it, it, within the film industry, yeah. well, create roles for people with disabilities, hire people who um, to fill those roles that are already there. Like, you know, there's so many spots on, you know, there's so many roles that are being played by people who are able-bodied, um, you know, in major films, um, in television shows, you know, so just give people, there are actors out there, you know, I'm, I also do acting, you know, um, mm -hmm. I have a disability, I can fill the role, um, mm -hmm. but, and you know, there are some things that are happening, that there's uh, amputees Hollywood, so, you know, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, people can go through them to find amputees, um, mm -hmm. there's a more recent, uh, casting company, but this is, again, this is all from the States, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I'm constantly getting uh, emails and, you know, looking for below knee amputee or above knee amputee or people with muscular dystrophy um, who are actors. So it's about actually hiring people who are out there, who are available um, to play those roles, you know, and you're going to, I think you'll get more of a real experience or real acting out of it anyway because they know what it's like to be in that position you know so um they're not having to learn what it's like to to be an amputee in order to play an amputee mm -hmm. um you are an amputee so you can just get down to you know doing the actual job mm -hmm. but um yeah it's about actually you know giving people the opportunity and the chance they're out there so um yeah and just the last last question about um uh, Wheel a Mile, are you considering turning that into a series or, you know, what are your thoughts on what format and this might be a good place to ask for some producers to come on board. <laughs> yeah, I'll take all the help I can get. Um, so again, like it's, it's in early stages. Um, originally, the original idea was just this challenge and, t and to be a, a vlog, a video blog um, on the website um, and so that People could look at it, see it, um, and you know, watch the videos and maybe go, oh yeah, I'm going to try that as well, you know, um, and get the stories out there. So um, it's only recently that, like I said, that I thought well, there's there, there's more to this, and um, yeah. So I don't know about a series. Um, I have other things that I want to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of projects going on in my head um, at all times. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, but there's definitely a, a short story in there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a feature story 
yeah. you know, like a, a long story that can be told um, just about disability in general and not just people, you know, in wheelchairs. But um, yeah, so but for me, it's what I know, you know, I spend my days in a wheelchair. So um, it's the it's the easiest story out of that for me to be able to, mm. I guess, put together and yeah. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. I, I love the project. So I would like to see it going places. So thank you. <laughs> um, can we play clip five, please, which is a scene from Love, Marriage and Kabul. So we've got a specific scene. <laughs> Who's the girl? Ani. Ari. Oh. Girl, na ba siyo? Girl, na si. Girl, na ba siyo? Oh, kaya. Bueno. Ni girl ni Fatima. Oh, ani girl Fatima. Ari. Ni girl na ba yaya Fatima mas na ba yaya sa? Iba siya sa il para sa amesh ni. Oh. Kaya bat kam bdi na biya daish. کی بود؟ از آن جیگر خون میس. الان فهم کنی خوشحال شد همه چیز را دید خیلی؟ نه. خوشحال شد؟ ها خیلی خوشحال شد. من میگم درست است؟ من میگم درست است میگم ما چه مخود؟ حالا خب این برای تو میخوایی برای کس دیگر خون میس؟ چی را لباسی را؟ لباس را لباس را باید کم اینجوری باید کم میگم درست است؟ نه گفتم خورد شم نی کلامش میگم ما چه؟ تو مال خیلی لباس را دیمون میفته یکی من. خیلی بازم بهتر شد. فیلم گرفتم درست نی؟ بازم بهتر شد. بسیار زیاد. So, 
um, yeah, we meant to play another clip, but we have another clip. But <laughs> I do love this scene, so that's fantastic. Um, the clip that we meant to play, I'll just describe it for you. <laughs> it was about an Australian <laughs> journalist who um, who actually goes along um, for on this trip. And um, she's sort of in the film a little bit, you know, in a few different scenes. Um, so I wanted to ask you about why um, you wanted to include her as sort of witnessing this story um, as a white Australian woman traveling. Um, so sorry we couldn't play that scene, there was a mix up, but um, yeah, tell me a bit about uh, the thinking behind that and why you want to include her uh, lens on your film. Sure. Well, I'm happy we watched this clip, to be <laughs> yeah. honest, because it is also, and um, this last uh, moment is one of my favorite uh, moments in the film as well, because yeah. um, uh, I'm not going to tell you what happens, but uh, things do happen after this moment. Um, so the Australian journalist was Virginia Hussiger, who's an ABC journalist. Uh, at the time, she was on 5.30 News every day um, in Canberra. And uh, to tell you, I didn't want to have her in the film. This uh, When I arrived at the airport, I, I was there before Mahbuba arrives. And I was at the airport, you know, ready to get the first shot. And uh, I didn't even know her. So if you look at the beginning of the film, I almost miss her. I don't even know who she is. I don't really care about her. I'm following uh, the person I know. But then later I realized she sits in the same car as yeah. us. So... Um, this, yes, um, <laughs> yeah. and as I said, uh, I was very open to capture everything. Um, the decision of including her in the film later, I mean, I interviewed her, I shot everything she did, etc. Uh, I just wasn't sure at the time of filming uh, whether or not uh, this is going to work for the love story I was telling. Mm -hmm. But after viewing the material and in the edit room, we spent a long time discussing whether or not to have her in. And uh, there were obviously uh, two sides to the story. Some people said n no, some people said yes. I was at the end uh, quite a strong advocate of keeping her in, uh, very much because of uh, two things. One uh, that I mentioned earlier was about the audience. She was the audience I was trying to um, I guess make aware or um, sort of share this story with. She actually wrote uh, an article, a very controversial article about uh, women uh, wearing hijabs in Afghanistan and girls being sold um, to you know forced marriages etc. So this was a very relevant story and perhaps that's why uh, she was there. Um, I liked uh, having her in the film because as I said she was the audience that I wanted to uh, sort of show a different side to the, the or at least the complexity of the situation but the other thing was that she was asking a lot of the questions that I was sure the audience watching the film are going to ask and that sort of worked quite yeah. um, smoothly didn't have to have narrations etc I actually had a voice a questioning voice uh, voice in the film uh, that sort of uh, challenged uh, uh, the main character of the film as well on some of those hot topics or controversial topics. Yes, because it, it's almost like you've used her as a narrative device then because you don't have voiceover and you know, narration. So she yeah, sort well, of works it, into... I didn't use her, she was just there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, it worked out really beautifully because at the end she does play a role in this in this story. So um, if you can tell the... Well, you know, if, if you can mention that, or is that sort no, of? No, I'm uh, happy yeah. to mention which part. Which is think? which? Basically, she goes, comes back, and does a story on it, and then oh, that yes. has an impact. Yes, absolutely. Um, I haven't really shared much about the film and what happened with it, etc. But yes, when she came back, um, mm -hmm. there is an orphan. There's two orphanages um, at the time in that Mahbuba has to attend to, and one of them she's gone there to close down. Uh, so among sort of uh, so sorting out this marriage issue, she has to also do her own projects and the, the other projects that she's there for. And one of the projects is to close down one of the orphanages because they've run out of funding. And we go there and she's not obviously not able to do so emotionally. Um, and so when we come back, um, 
with help of Virginia and some of the footage I had, we edited the piece and it was uh, played on 7.30 report. And in one night it raised 60 grand, uh, which was enough to keep the orphanage going for two more years. Mm. So yep, yeah, definitely she had a huge yeah. impact afterwards. I think she was quite transformed by her own journey, not by the film, but just her, her experience there. Yeah, yeah and, and the text appears at the end of the film explaining what happened with that and mm. sort of, so then you realize, uh, you know, there was a more important role, you know, um, besides moving the story along, but she actually Absolutely. plays, yes. has a real impact. Um, if it is possible to play that clip, can we play it now? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. I was hoping we could still see a little it's bit of that. It's my fault. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, all right, so let's play a clip from The Last Goldfish now, which is clip six, please. At the airport in Port of Spain, the customs officer notices the place of birth on my Australian passport. Welcome home, she says. Immediately, I am swept up by this place. I find my best friend, Wendy. The years melt away when she throws her arms around me. I eat everything I haven't tasted for years. Fried bake and flying fish. Tulum, pomsi tea, pomerax, tamarind balls, pickled mango and salt prunes, callaloo soup and sorrel drink. I remember being here at Maracas Bay with my parents. My mother's calamine painted lips. My father playing with me in the waves. I miss them. I search for traces of the Jews who escaped to Trinidad. The family's Tausha, Stetcher, Huth, and many more. When I lived here as a child, I had no idea my father was a Jewish refugee. They are two of only 600 refugees who make it to the safety of Trinidad. Twelve days later, the British colonial authorities close this escape route, and boats with Jewish refugees like them are turned back to Europe. <clears throat> so, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, ethical considerations that you had to wrestle with in this film, because um, there are a few things happening. One is you're telling a story about your family, but it's not just your story. There are other family members, um, and also. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, representing Trinidad and the responsibility there. So mm. talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think my greatest anxiety around an identity was being a Trinidadian. And, you know, it really was when I first went back there, which was so many years after I'd left. I left when I was about 14. <clears throat> I really wondered if I'd just be like this tourist, you know, like a white tourist and no one would care. And, but it was literally as soon as I showed that passport, there was this welcome, at, you know, right at the airport. And then that moment of total absorption into this culture and the smells and the sounds, like all of it was so familiar and so wonderful. And my best friend Wendy, who was, you know, just immediately crushed me, you know, in a giant hug, took me out dancing and made me really drunk on margaritas. So I felt <laughs> right at home. <laughs> But the thing I felt most anxious about was how to talk about black power, you know, how to talk about this thing that had had, that was such an awakening moment for me in terms of race and my, you know, my race and, and you know, the, the complexity of the feelings around that. And it's very complex, you know, there were people in, you know, it, it just is very complex. So going back, all of this is in my head and, um, I make the film, I try and balance what I think are the politics, personal and otherwise in that. And then I took it back to Trinidad a few weeks ago. And so the moment of showing the film in Trinidad was like, you know, the litmus test. And I was so nervous. And I wasn't just nervous about 
the fact that I was representing Trinidad, it was also because I'm a lesbian. And Trinidad had just, like a few weeks before I got there, this American Trinidadian guy had turned up with his husband in Port of Spain and had decided that was the last time he was going to go to Port of Spain in Trinidad and not have his relationship with his husband acknowledged. So he challenged the Trinidadian buggery laws and also the gay and lesbian um, laws, which if you were gay or lesbian, you could go to jail between five years and life imprisonment. <laughs> so lesbian narrator turning up with her film, you know, slight little bit of nerves. Um, anyway, so that court case, he actually won it. And so the um, judgment was that this law was actually against his human rights and that the law should be overturned. But of course, there's a process around that, which will take a little while and it's not decided yet. And immediately all the churches immediately got on board and said that, you know, homosexuals were destroying this, you know, the, the cultural and social life of Trinidad, which is incredible when it, you're talking about carnival, which is just like Mardi Gras a thousand times, you know, more camp. It's like, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, lesbian narrator. And the first screening is in a little town outside of Port of Spain. It's 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. School kids and retired people. <laughs> and I think I'm going to be dead, you know. And so the film happens. And at the end, I'm really nervous about it. But I get to the end and the applause is immediate. It's really strong. It's this wonderful response. And I get up for the Q&A and the Q questions just come. And they come from everyone and for all different reasons. And... People afterwards coming up to me, you know, I could hardly, I could, couldn't get away in a way because people, number one, they loved the fact that Trinidad was being represented, that this part of the history was being represented, that I'd come back to show the film and, you know, was wanted to, to be there with the film. Being a lesbian narrator didn't seem to matter to any of those school children and retirees. <laughs> so I felt like, you know, that was, that was actually a real... It was a, a really uh, wonderful moment. And the actual premiere in Port of Spain, which was much bigger and much more, like, much bigger audience, it was the same thing. It was an overwhelming sense of having given something back. And in a way, that was one of the very first things that I wanted to do. It was like a thank you to Trinidad for, you know, saving the lives of those 600-odd refugees who just managed to buy a ticket on a boat that happened to go to a tropical island they'd never heard of, um, mm. but basically that saved their lives. Mm. So that was one story around that. But with the um, family, I was very um, careful with that. I think, you know, this is my story about um, my experiences of, you know, growing up in a family where history wasn't talked about and where my father hid hid the grief in his life, which involved, yeah, other children, another relationship, you know, so there's a lot of loss. And finding all of those people and building relationships with them, the last thing I wanted to do was damage that because they were quite new families. Some of them I only met like three years ago. <laughs> so it's all very close. But so I just did a couple of things. I, I didn't, I think it's always really important when you're making documentaries that you don't let your subjects control your documentary but you do have to find ways that to have you know that let people come with you and so I would show little bits of things just to give um, certain people who were, might be a little bit sensitive um, how I was going what I was how I was structuring the story and it was quite positive what was coming back and then before the premiere last year at Sydney Film Festival which was an amazing opportunity um, I sent a little personal premiere to every single person in the family and I said, you know, the film's going to be on in Sydney in a few days. Of course, none of them see it because they all live over there somewhere. Um, and, you know, and I just wait for this kind of responses to come back and one after the other it comes back and it's OK. <laughs> you know, and they're in fact proud of it or they feel that, you know, I've done something really important for the family. And my nephew, who lives in New York, said he did the Q&A at the Jewish Film Festival in New York. And he, he got up and the very first question that he was asked was, so tell us about your relationship with your father. And his father is my half-brother. And his half, my half-brother and his dad was very seriously affected by 
the experiences of his parents, which involved, you know, he, he was born a couple of weeks before the first, the Second World War started. And within a few months, he was interned with his mother. My father was interned somewhere else, so they were separated for quite a few months. So, it, and then my father comes back and they grow up in this, um, for four years he was in this, what is an internment camp. And, you know, growing up in this very confined, claustrophobic experience. And then when my father's relationship breaks down with his mother, all this trauma that's coming. And these are people who find out that their parents have been murdered, their uncles and aunts, that they've lost all their friends, they don't know, they have no idea what's going on. It's the chaos of post-World War II. You know, and people are reeling with what's happened. And this kid grows up in the midst of all that. He was so, he was such a damaged person. And for Jerry, his son, he suddenly realised that he'd grown up with a mentally ill person who was really quite ill. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, this dawns on him, like, at the Q&A at the New York Jewish Film Festival. And it was videoed, and it's the most moving um, interview. You can see the shock of him suddenly understanding this relationship with his father and how his um, father was so mentally ill. But it was fine. He said it was very cathartic and, you know, mm -hmm. so on a personal level that family has expanded um, in terms of its kind of knowledge and information about themselves. Mm -hmm. And again, coming back to the refugee stuff, you know, just constantly reminding people these refugee stories, you know, that these people who are now, you know, journalists or school teachers or cleaners or whatever, that's their background and it was kindness or luck or good policy, you know, that saves them mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. who knows what. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you put all these pieces of a puzzle together and now people can see, uh, you know, a mosaic. It's, it's not a perfect, you know, sort of image, but yeah. people can start to see, uh, make sense of something. And you know the weirdest thing with that film? Like, I do feel like it talks to quite a few communities. When I'm sitting there with the Trinidadians watching it, it's all about Trinidad. <laughs> and when I'm sitting with a queer audience, it's really queer. And when I'm sitting with the Jewish people, it's like so Jewish. It's incredible. It just stretches and kind of makes a shape depending on the audience, which I thought was, I didn't yeah. expect. I'm not part of any of those communities and I still, you know, connected with all oh, that's of them. The other, so I saw, that's the other I saw the spectrum, I think. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, that's great. I just have a couple of more questions and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. Um, so, uh, Adrian, this one is for you. Um, if someone else made Black Divas, how would it, how would it be? And, and what do you think would be missed or would be different? You said that for you it was, you knew that this was a spiritual sort of experience making this film. No, someone so else drag was spiritual. Drag, sorry, yes, drag was spiritual. So if someone else made it, would they have cared that much or would, what do you think would have happened? Um, it depends on who makes it. Um, someone who's not from the community is what I mean. Still depends on who makes it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a tricky question. So I don't okay. know who they are. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and I wanted to ask Laz that as well. So if you hadn't made that project and someone else who wasn't from the disability community had made it, what would be different, do you think? I'm not quite sure. I guess, again, it depends on who. But um, I think that um, you, have to, you have to have experienced it yourself in order to be able to understand it and to be able to to actually get the story and the right story um if that makes sense um you know like and, and part of this whole thing is so the able-bodied people actually understand um so i mean how do you get someone to understand something you don't understand yourself so i think it really needs to be someone who who is in a wheelchair who's doing it, it doesn't necessarily have to be me but it, it's me who's doing it. Um, but it definitely needed to be someone who's in a wheelchair um, because, you know, I'm trying to get basically you guys to understand what my life is like. So, um, yeah, that's I mean, how does someone, you know, else tell my story um, without me? So, yeah. 
And we were talking earlier where you said you were brought on board as a consultant for a project. And can you talk a bit about that and that experience? Um, because there were people that <coughs> didn't have that experience that were trying to tell this story. So Yeah, yeah. So the it was a film about amputees. Um, and I was brought in as a consultant because the person who was making the film had didn't know any amputees. Um, I forget, she put an ad up somewhere and I answered the ad, so it wasn't even like she knew me. Um, and so I answered this ad, but you know, like, yes, it's important to have someone collaborate or some consultants um, around it, but you then have to actually listen to those people. Um, so if you're gonna tell a story about amputees, for instance, um, and you have actors who aren't amputees playing amputees and you've brought someone on to help you understand what that's like and help the actors understand what that's like, you then have to actually, I think, take on board what's being said. So it, I've sort of felt like pointless and useless there um, because I wasn't being listened to. So I think it's, yeah, so it's really important that if you're actually gonna do a project that and you bring someone in to be able to understand that that disability or that background or whether, you know, whether it's being a person of color or a woman or, you know, religious background, you then have to actually be open to listening <laughs> to that person. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so just the last question for each of our panelists now. So, um, how can we achieve the vision of nothing about us without us industry-wide in, in, in sort of the documentary world in Australia? So any ideas or thoughts or um, on, on this sort of idea of making it broader for the industry-wide and doesn't need to be about your particular community but for all marginalized groups that are underrepresented. Who wants to start, Amin? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, well, I guess this, um, you know, the idea of representation is a compli complex uh, um, sort of issue. I, in my work, uh, I think being a migrant, being a professional migrant, uh, I left my country of birth at seven and I lived in about 10 countries before arriving here. So a very nomadic upbringing. And I always being from an Iranian background and, you know, what has happened there since the revolution in 79 and how it's sort of completely transformed in the political space. Um, I think many Iranians uh, would sort of agree with what I say, where they constantly feel like they're going to be their cultural ambassadors and, and never sort of make anyone, anybody unhappy or do anything wrong, because that would mean they're probably the only Iranian in the room, like <laughs> here. And it would yeah. mean that they suddenly, the whole co country or the yeah. whole culture is going to be labeled as <laughs> that particular action. And unfortunately, we don't have politicians who do a really good job. In fact, they drive on creating yeah. controversial issues. Yeah. So I think this idea really come, and in Australia, I mean, I see that there's a lot of really great sort of, uh, or the beginnings of really great movements are happening with the inclusion mm -hmm. of women in film, inclusion of people of uh, Cal backgrounds, or mm -hmm. many, many other programs that have started engaging um, yeah. those uh, minorities uh, mm -hmm. within the industry. And I think that's a really positive thing. But unless something actually happens in the political space, I don't really see it mm -hmm. changing because, I mean, um, I've been thinking about this phrase that we've been um, discussing or sharing tonight for a long while now. And I see that um, as I mentioned, I think most people in the industry, for example, in the film industry, for example, know about this. Um, and I wonder why they do not engage people in a meaningful way or they do not hire uh, people with those necessary skills. I, I, I think the, the conversation should be around why. And uh, going back to the little story I shared with you at the beginning, me as a young filmmaker and not knowing what I was getting myself into, I think there are people in the industry, in our state industries, that actually know mm -hmm. what that experience is, right? And they yeah. know what yeah. meaningful engagement is, and they know how ethical filmmaking is supposed to be, for example, or how the responsibilities are for a filmmaker, 
or when they are funding a film that is, or funding a TV show that's about a particular culture and the makers are not from that culture, mm -hmm. I'm sure they know mm -hmm. that it's better yeah. uh, to have a meaningful engagement with that community or a key creative role, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. I think they know that. So I think the responsibility or the action really needs to be made by mm -hmm. our uh, state and federal agencies yeah. and in the political uh, mm -hmm. space. Um, I really do, unfortunately, I don't see any, I mean, we can talk about this mm -hmm. among ourselves, but I feel like we are actually uh, sitting among people who completely agree with the issue and mm -hmm. um, yeah. the conversation needs to be done, but I uh, I think unless we are a, proactive sort of, about it. And yeah, or make changes yeah. on the, uh, in the yeah. political space, I don't think that changing, yeah. because at the end of the day, there's a producer who applies for a fund and they get fund for a project and the yeah. funding bodies have the power to mm -hmm. um, in fact enforce certain yeah. um, I mean enforce is probably not a good influence, but, uh, influence or yeah. Uh, yeah create some sort of or conditions when that sort of engagement is better and I think it's better for the filmmakers as well because they end up making a more authentic mm -hmm. story it's not about troubling mm -hmm. them or creating a problem mm -hmm. um, so I am not of one to say that, oh, you know, nobody should make films about Iranians because, you know, you've got me. Um, mm -hmm. No, not at all. I think, uh, <laughs> in fact, sometimes I'm so blown away by films made about particular community from outside of that community and they're able to have that really interesting perspective mm -hmm. um, that people from the community uh, would have been blinded to. So, I, I, you know, there's, and, you know, obviously, I'm sure you know many of uh, very contrasting experiences to that where you see a film about a community or your own community yeah. or another community and you just you just can't take watching yeah. any more sort of uh, quite cringe stereo sometimes. Oh, more than <laughs> that, yeah, stereotypes, stereotypes yeah. being sort of pushed yeah. down your throat all the time yeah. and mm -hmm. it's really um, condescending mm -hmm. at best mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah I think uh, my hope would be that the change is made uh, through policies in our state mm -hmm. and federal agencies mm -hmm. And Sue, I mean, the, I mean, it's talking about a top-down approach. And what do you what do you think? Um, yeah, no, top down is really important. I think leadership in policy is is vital because you you know it makes a difference. You know that if there are quotas, that it makes a difference. You know that if a film festival says we're going to make it 50-50, women directors, male directors, it will make a difference. So really important. But one of the other things is like avoiding tokenism. So. You know, as someone who used to work in the building industry, I remember when we all went to TAFE to do our carpentry courses and there were six women and there were six classes and the head teacher in all his wisdom said, I'm going to put one of you in each class. And it was like, and we all got together and talked about it and we went to him and we went, no, we all want to be in the same class. We want it to look normal. And we all went in the same class and that class was the one that got the best marks. Oh, wow. So I always go, you know, if you really go, you know, if you do, if, it, and it's about power relationships too. Who's got the power, you know? Is it, there's an assumption here that, you know, there's exclusion going on. So if there is exclusion going on and that, that has to change, then the ex people excluding have to, they have to make that change happen and we've got to pressure them. But at the same time, there is no money for artists in this country. Do not pretend. It <laughs> doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. Ultimately, there's very little public funding for what you do. So you've got to find ways to do what you love. You just got to do it, mm. you know. Adrian, <laughs> how do you think we can achieve nothing about us without us industry-wide in sort of the documentary world? Um, look, I, I just want to really echo what has already been said. I think it's definitely a top-down. Um, I've experienced it in terms of the Indigenous cinematic landscape or cinema landscape in terms of when I first started out that you know there was um, there wasn't really an indigenous filmmaking industry mm. like there is now mm. um, there was definitely um, filmmakers actors black theater uh, you know there was a huge history that came that was coming through but in terms of you know if you if you look at um, indigenous cinema today uh, you turn on your screen, you know, TV, you know, you, you, most people will, n will have seen some Indigenous content somewhere 
um, whether it's in the, on the big screen, small screen, um, webisodes, but that and that's been a, a really long progression of top down in terms of Screen Australia, particularly funding an, an Indigenous unit to um, and the proof is in the pudding of that unit, I think, um, and it's a really interesting model um, to speak to other minority um, mm -hmm. underrepresented filmmaking groups mm -hmm. because it was it was the industry going you know what we're actually going to put our money where our mouth is um, and it wasn't you know and it was a it was a co collaboration mm -hmm. between m m what I would call mainstream mm -hmm. and the indigenous unit um, and I think the proof was in the pudding of that by putting that money in it fostered and it developed an industry um, which now, you know, you could go to the cinema in probably 12 months' time and have the choice of two Indigenous films yeah. to watch, yeah. you know. Um, so there's, there's that side of things um, and I would love to see that model lifted up and yeah. transferred over in for Iranian filmmakers, yeah. LGBT, do you know what I mean? And yes, I, I, I was very aware of those workshops yeah. that I was in, yeah. thinking, imagine if a Sudanese community yeah. were given these resources and given this infrastructure and this framework. Imagine the stories that we would yeah. tell. You know, there, there are, there's more diversity stories coming through, yeah. but they're, not, they're still not being made by the people that are living yeah. those stories. Um, and you know, I used to be quite, I used to be quite staunch and radical about it, and really, hard, as I said before, when I started, real hard line about, particularly as an Indigenous person, with so much taken from my culture, when it came to storytelling and talking mm. about my people and my people's experience in this country, I was really territorial about whose, mm. you know, whose story was that, to tell and. You know, there was this, it became a real flavour of the month, the Indigenous story space. And um, the more success we had in that industry, the more people wanted to tell that story. And I think the, the commissioning editors of the Indigenous unit could probably write a book mm -hmm. about the pictures and the stories that they were given to assess yeah. um, in terms of, you know, it seemed to be the flavour of the month. People started thinking, oh, that's how you get funding that's how you get your film up, yeah. you know. They started changing characters that they've been writing for as non-Indigenous people into Indigenous people, you know. Yeah. I can't tell you the projects that I'd been asked to consult on mm -hmm. and what they thought they were going to get away with yeah. and the stories that they wanted to tell. One project, there was quite high-profile filmmakers wanted to make this project um, and they had literally taken probably seven different Dreamtime stories and iconography or, or legends from seven completely different regions and put them into a house. Um, so you had seven different spirits now jammed into one house to haunt the inhabitants of that house. And it's like, they didn't, and when I would say you've, that, that's seven different communities or tribes and and their stories from their area that they are custodians of, you've put them all into a house in in New South Wales to haunt white people, mm. you know, and, and just, they didn't get it on a really, really immediate level. Um, yeah. And these were really serious filmmakers with serious financing behind them. Yeah. And they thought that that's what they could do. And talking about tokenism, when you go into a room and say, guess what? You can't do that, you know, and nor should you. And these are some of the reasons why. Yeah. I sat there with like five people with their mouths open, you know, on the floor. And it's like there was such a disconnect to, well, why can't we? Yeah. Well, why don't if, well why, what if we just change their names? Mm. Yeah. Or what if we make one of the people in the house Aboriginal? It's like, no, mm. you're not getting it, yeah. Yeah. you know. So mm. there's, tokenism is quite, can be quite toxic. Yes. Um, but I really do celebrate and am a product of mm. 
yeah. that modelling when yes. it is top down. Um, and um, I wish that they would, and they should, I, I really believe they should take that model and put it throughout Sprint Australia in different for other communities. communities. Yeah, I mean, from a CALP perspective, I can definitely say that there is this movement since Screen Australia started talking about diversity and wanting more diverse content that a lot of people are sort of jumping on the bandwagon, okay, we can make diverse content, but on our terms and in our way and in a really strange way where someone is called up and asked to be a consultant and, you know, either not paid much or not their point of view is not respected, you know, you in the room but you're not listened to like you were saying. Um, and everything is happening and people are basically, you know, profiting from, it's, it's extractive filmmaking is what is going on. Um, so, um, okay, so Laz, what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, how can we change um, our industry to sort of be more inclusive? Yeah, well, I think I agree with what's been said so far, but perhaps, um, yeah, I really wouldn't, I don't, I don't, not sure. Um, perhaps with the funding bodies, making sure that if, you know, we're telling a story about a particular cultural group or, you know, a particular people, then there needs to be a certain amount of those people actually involved in the making of and production and acting so that they are included in, you know, um, the, the space is made for them to be a part of and to move forward. Yeah. And career progressions, which is also lacking, which is if you just have people as consultants and they're not building credits, they're not actually building their careers. So, yeah. Um, all right, I think that wraps up our conversation, but uh, we're open for Q&A. Uh, please keep uh, your questions to questions and not comments, and also on topic, please. But it's also your, the way that you got that agreement with people in the first place. Like, you must have had agreement and discussed what you were doing so that people, like, participated, voluntarily participated to tell their story. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of figure, like for myself personally, um, I think filmmaking, a lot of filmmaking is about instinct and gut. Um, and I, I really feel like people who have a question around whether or not they should be including or talking to someone or seeking permission from someone, instinctually already knows that answer to that question. Um, and I've, I've seen people that know that they should be seeking permission and choose very consciously not to. Um, and um, I've seen the opposite as well, when, where there's incredibly great collaboration. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. add to that. So just to explain extractive, because it is a new term that is sort of, um, it came about, uh, I think people started to talk about it more last year. And I have the original article where I first saw extractive uh, filmmaking mentioned. So I'll, I'll just read out how the person who wrote about this uh, talks about it. It's just a couple of sentences um, and it'll clarify a few things I think for everyone. Um, what makes a story extractive is when documentarians and journalists arrive in a community with a personal agenda to tell the story they want to tell, either to support a political agenda or to, the, to advance their own careers without fully respecting the needs and the points of view of the communities where the stories come from. So, very polite way of saying it. <laughs> it is a very polite way of saying it. And just to explain where the term extractive comes from, um, it's, so this uh, particular filmmaker is a documentary filmmaker who's talking about why they thought of this term and why it applies to documentary filmmaking. It struck me that when people come from the outside and take, whether it's anthropologists, academics, artists, journalists, or filmmakers, and never consider collaborating with the protagonists or replenishing what's been taken, it's exactly the same practice as extractive industries like mining, hydroelectric, or industrial agriculture. Multinational companies who steal the wealth from below the land never share the proceeds and in the process destroy the environment. So I hope that sort of clarifies, and you're definitely not doing that. I mean, it's a lot of your personal story, and it's if people you're filming with are in it, and you're consulting them, you're talking to them, um, you also have key creatives that are part of those communities. Uh, you're paying people properly, you're not exploiting anyone involved. 
uh, you're on the right track. Um, I personally feel anyone should be, in an ideal world, anyone should be able to tell any story. There are power structures in place that sort of make it easier for some people to tell other people's stories. So, but it's harder for some communities to tell. Say, for example, it's easier for a Western filmmaker to go east, travel east and tell those stories, um, whereas Eastern filmmakers can, don't sometimes have enough resources to fly down here and tell, say, a story about white Australians. So we hear a lot of Western perspectives on East, but we don't hear Eastern perspectives on West. Uh, so there are power structures in place, but in an ideal world, everyone should be able to tell any story as long as they're doing it respectfully, without, being, without exploiting, and in sort of a very collaborative, respectful way. I think I said that you don't actually, like you still have to control this work that you're making, but you, it's all this, you know, it's all these relationships that you build around the trust of your project. Ultimately, you know, and you can show people what you've done before it's screened. That's often a really good thing to do so that they're ready if there's something controversial that w might affect them. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you change it, but it, 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 again, it's respectful to give people yeah. warning if it's a bit... Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important. In fact, um, although I thought, I mean, I had a very close relationship with my main character, but after we had a private screening bef with her before it was screened, and she pointed out things that was pretty sensitive to her that mm -hmm. you it? just wouldn't mm -hmm. have known about. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think when you make a film, look, uh, I mean, I would not ever say that it doesn't have me printed on it. I mean, you, it's at, at the end of the day, you're behind that camera, you're behind the lens, it's your mm. point of view. And no matter how many people, I mean, the more you have on your team, I think the better, because they will be able to help you out in making a balanced uh, story and stay um, ethical, I think. Um, mm. But... I mean, at the end of the day, you're directing, you're driving, you're the captain of that ship, you're turning the wheel. Um, I think it's important to at least show the participants what the story is before it's released to public or somehow include them in the, mm. the making of. There's a, there's a film on, on IVU at the moment, uh, the Namajira, Namajira film, yes. about the Namajira project, yeah. which you can see on IVU on ABC. Um, the only reason why I say that is because for some reason, I watched that the other night, and um, it's an incredibly moving and affecting film that shows the collaboration, or um, the storytelling of collaboration between black and white to, um, there's so, I mean, there's so many layers. There's a, there's, um, there's a process about getting the, right, the copyright of Albert Namajira's work back to his family that's owned by a white man. Um, the co-director of, or the director of the theatre project Namajira about Albert Namajira's life, is directed by a white man, starring an obviously an indigenous actor. But they're in a co-collaboration, a symbiotic kind of relationship, and then they go back to the community to Hel um, Hermansburg, where Albert Namajira was from, and work with his family. Um, and there's this beautiful, there's this beautiful moment in the film where Trevor Jamison, who's an Aboriginal um, artist and actor and writer, um, ha takes the takes the theatre project back to the community, to the family, to show to show them the script and to read the script. And then there's this beautiful scene between these, I think, two aunties later on, out in the scrub, where they're talking elderly, that and they're talking about, you know we're going to get Trevor and we're going to give him some notes in their way of saying we're going to give him some notes to, to help that story and to help that script. And that's an Aboriginal man taking that Indigenous content story back to the family, to the Aboriginal family, um, and they're helping him tell that story. And it, made, and it made that project and that story so much more richer mm. and authentic and the truth but um, there's just something about that whole entire documentary where it's just a constant um, symbiotic relationship between black and white and they you know they go to London with, with the theatre project they meet the Queen I mean it's just so many layers mm. it's kind of the epitome of what we've talked about tonight mm. in in front of you playing out in front of you mm. um, and 
you know, the, the danger of, or the, the fear of seeking permission or, or collaborating in that really vulnerable way is that the agenda is a word that I picked up on in that last statement because if you have an agenda and, mm. and you bring that collaboration to that person and they don't want to, that they're going to take away part of the story is your fear that you want to tell because you have an agenda. And I think that's dishonest. Mm. I think that's a dishonesty. Mm. And that's what, it's like going in someone's purse and taking money. You know, you know you're stealing. Um, whereas if it's, if it's conducive and collaborative and truthful and the fact that someone says you can't tell that part of the story, then you have to accept that. But I bet you any money that there's another part of the story that they'll allow you to tell that is way better mm. and way more authentic and truthful than what you originally yeah. imagined. Mm. Because you're putting your perspective and your politics and your agenda onto their story.